On today's episode of Anish Think, Coffee makes another comeback. I've got Pranoy from Kere Haklu, one of the cooler people in the coffee space in India, working a lot on the farm and plantation side, and we deep dive into that aspect of coffee. More on that after these short messages. Pranoy, Mr. Kere Haklu, good to have you on the show, man. Thanks, thanks for having me here, man. And we've been talking about uh, doing this for a while. I know, I know. And finally, uh, this trip of Bombay of yours, we're able to do this. Yeah. Uh, you were telling me you just finished harvest and you're in Bombay for sampling. Yeah, um, cut short a bit uh, because of rains, but um, that's something that's going to be a regular occurrence. So mid Feb finished. Um, although we started in mid mid to late November, it's a spectrum of coffees, you know. So the first few lots that we do in November start sampling now, and so up until. Hopefully, I'm done by April. Um, mid to late April, I'll be sort of sampling and dispatching coffees. So, coffee works like like wine in a way, right? There's a harvest yep. every year. That harvest will also uh, the quality will depend on weather conditions, what happened and happened, and stuff like that. So, take me through the whole landscape of a coffee plantation, right? A how did how did it even start in India? If we can take a little step back, and uh, Coming to today, where there are younger people like you, and there's, I'm sure, so much more processes introduced. So just give me like a little primer on the history and where we are right now. Yeah, it's a super interesting history about how coffee came into India and it originated in um, in Chikmagalur, where we're from. And uh, so a Sufi saint called Baba Budan in the late 1700s, he actually smuggled seven beans, seven being a holy number. Um, in his beard, actually, and he brought it into Chikmagalur, where they were planted at first, and then over different eras. Obviously, uh, we have a colonial history with sort of, um, you could say, commercialization of coffee in a sense. But uh, yeah, it's interesting because back then there was no the at least it wasn't uh, because of the British that the cof- coffee originally got here, but. Uh, it's uh, expanded a lot. It's it's really interesting. I went to Orissa and Araku Valley last yeah. year. Really interesting, man. Like for me, I'm really. I know what I what I thought I know of coffee was blown up, you know. Yeah. And so uh, that was a nice wake up call to know that it can be in uh, diverse conditions and diverse sort of um, landscapes. It can be yeah. like flatland for us. It's hills, as you've seen. Um, and so people are sort of even in the northeast now. I know someone in Maharashtra growing coffee. Oh, really? Where yeah. in Maharashtra? Uh, Goris Coffee, uh, Goris Forest Farm is what it's called. His name is Ashwin. I've met yeah. him briefly. Um, not major, but um, things like that for me in the face of climate change uh, can be the difference maker, you know, like outside the traditional zones of growing coffee. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, even that landscape's changing. Like Meghale, uh, those yeah. uh, that Varibog Dari Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah. guys are insane. Uh, some of the best coffees I've had in the last few years I agree. out of India. I agree. In one of those projects, Sankalps. Yeah. Uh, uh, beautiful stuff. Yeah, and it's not something you immediately think of when you think of coffee. And yeah. It's not easy. People should remember that because I haven't met Roy myself but heard a lot about him and a lot of respect to be doing that in remote areas like yeah. that where not just facilities but electricity and transport are major issues you know and it's not easy so let's come back to Chikmangdur. Uh seven beans are smuggled in and then what happened and then uh, it's it's interesting to see how it changed over time when I analyze coffee now and I look at uh, the where coffee is drunk I think it's really interesting I know we're fast forwarding a couple hundred years but uh, when I got involved um 2019, not so long ago now, but uh, um, I remember going to Delhi and I went to Blue Tokai for the first time and I really picked up on how over there people are a lot more open-minded, or at least back then, were a lot more open-minded to black cups of coffee. Whereas in the South, like my household, a lot of households that I've been a part of, coffee means sugar, milk and chicory and small cups, you know, and so that preconceived notion sort of limits how you are the intake of the be- the beverage itself you know and so um even my friends will come over and i'm brewing a pour over an aeropress and i'm like would you like a cup and it's like no 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 i can't drink black coffee yeah. and i'm like fair enough coffee doesn't agree with anyone with everyone that's what and i'm very okay with that i don't ever 
force it down someone's throat but i'm like what's your thought process why why do you think that and it's almost like or oh, black coffee can give me sort of increase my heart rate or give make my head spin and i'm like fair but not like this yeah. you know it's not it's not like that and we know that you know how we brew coffee is it's for the taste and of course it has different effects on people psychologically especially but uh yeah it's changing a nice time to be in this i think so uh, this is the whole thing right like i'm guessing majority of the flavor that you get in your cup uh keeping aside that you're brewing it properly or following a proper recipe and not messing around with the grind size and all the flavor is coming from the plantation for sure from the growth aspect right it's ultimately a fruit uh take me through the varietals and how does the landscape of the farm change right because i think you grow a lot of other things there as well avocados yep. and other stuff so if you can just go into the kind of varieties are there uh which months you pluck what how does that work how do you process it how do you get the green bean ready for the roaster just yep. till there uh, that'll be great yeah sweet so um so at the surface level it's important to realize that coffee has a lot of different species so coffee or coffea is the genus under which there's several species robusta and arabica are the most widely drunk or widely consumed species liberica and excelsa at the moment are making a slight resurgence which is nice and i think um it's very much needed you need to try new things um but it uh, talking about just the arabica and robusta for now um it's kind of sad in india like um so we have a lot of plant breeders they they're professionals and this is what they do for a living and they're botanists and things like that and um you go to different parts of the world and they have amazing names you know like bourbon and geisha <laughs> and pakamara in india it's selection 5b selection 6 selection 795 and you're like man you had an opportunity right there yeah. to anything you know but that's just it um kaveri from what i know is the only indian name only indian uh named varietal and um but what that what a varietal basically means is that under arabica in this case um there's a lot of breeding that happens and so you're looking for positive or sort of um beneficial traits from different plants and you bring them together and so it could have been done in the lab it could have been done by grafting at some point um and so let's talk about selection 9 for example um that's what i consider an early bloomer so like that's generally what we harvest first in like sometimes i remember two seasons ago it was even october and so what that means is from the time of flowering in jan feb march up until we uh it's a red cherry quite literally like yeah. any cherries that we eat um the gestation period is shortest and so it's like literally a baby being in a mother's stomach it's the same logic there and um if you look back at the lineage of the selection line it's really interesting it's actually um almost half ethiopian and another one called htt hybrid de timor which is from timor leste timor leste in micronesia Poly- near, near australia basically small island and um amazing cups amazing cups man like i love that uh, varietal the selection um but it's a it's a funny position to be in because you can't the cups are great but basically because it ripens so early now the seasonality is changed so the monsoon is still going on till october november so we can harvest but it's too moist to dry so because of that we've had to sacrifice on maybe 1 or 1.25 uh, points in terms of a cup score but going for another selection which genetically is a bit later bloomer which we'd rather we'd rather stable conditions a bit of sunshine things like that and so that's arabica robusta which um in my opinion has a unnecessary bad reputation um maybe not unnecessary it has a bad reputation for a reason but that's changing now what is that reason man bad quality in the past to be honest it was like a filler coffee which uh India has produced a lot of for many many decades now and to now by using it the good roasters around the world have sort of realized that espresso blends yeah. really require good robusta and if you can it's not just about saving that 30% which is arabica it's 
amplifying the other coffee you know it's it's lit a blend is a blend for a reason you know it's to like bring two po- again like how we're talking about plant breeding it's the same thing you bring two positive attributes together elevates the whole experience and that's what we want most people you not everywhere but fair to assume that the espressos or you rather plan for an espresso which is going to be had with milk and so um traditionally not harvested with care not sanitized not hygienically packed some i've heard of stories of um shipping containers showing up in different parts of the world originating from india and apparently they would open up a sack and inside their stones there's oh. things yeah man and like like we have women who sit and sort the coffee after yeah. it goes through the machinery broken bangles and things like that yeah. so that's our fault yeah. Bad you know yeah. yeah so um we have to do put in twice the effort to get rid of that reputation because a first reputation sticks it's it that's what you remember robusta also again i think yeah, a lot of roasters have also tried to put that out more right mm. dope it done something yeah a uh, dope it done it with you yeah with yeah, me, yeah, with me. With the robusta yeah. with you uh sabko i think everyone's trying to trip in and do something and <clears throat> to me one of my recent moments of robusta was uh, in vietnam there's one coffee chain that only does robusta okay and that was so fruity yeah. that espresso was just yeah. so fruity and i was like okay it can be yeah espresso is man amazing you yeah. know like the every talk about crema a lot yeah. but even the how it tastes you know the for me it's a sweetness and acidity yeah. balance and i agree i think we need to position it right we can't pretend that it's going to be as good or we can't perceive it as arabica or judge it like arabica but espresso is a good place to start yeah. that's a good starting point What about the other two? Uh Liberica and Excelsior. Yeah. For me I have a lot of faith in Liberica. Um that's what we grow as well and we've been sort of um expanding our nursery of it as well. Um it's a very interesting plant. It grows like a tree. And uh funnily enough I used to work at another farm in 2018 before I got into coffee and I was just into the sort of avocados and alternative produce that we grow. And I remember driving in the jeep with my dad and I was like what is that you know it's like a monster compared to the other plants and so he's like oh it's liberica and i'm like i need to know about this and i remember back then 2018 there was nothing on the internet very few things um southeast asia uh, malaysia and the philippines in particular grow uh, liberica as well um for me the cups are very interesting people think It's close to the robusta flavor profile but not for me at all. Like maybe I would say that when the old factory when you smell it it's yeah. great and maybe it's not as developed in the cup itself but that just you just didn't understand it. And you got to maneuver it. But um to add to that they actually ripen in now like Feb and March which is amazing because it's warm, you know. The rains have come and gone and you never know. We're we're trying we're like bracing ourselves for the unthinkable but uh In a way it's good to have I mean definitely is good to have eggs in different baskets. Yeah. And the fourth one? Uh excels are similar, very similar to Liberica, grows it's what I would call a vegetative growth. So it puts out a lot of shoots, a lot of leaves. Um so it, it requires a lot of pruning and what we have to do is actually we everyone in the south we have these ladders which we actually use to harvest our pepper. And so you have to wrap it around a tree, climb up, it's quite difficult and sometimes if it's tall someone has to hold the ladder at the bottom and so um if you were to sell it what what happened with liberica and excelsa up until a few years ago was that people would harvest it do naturals do cherry with it and mix it with the robusta without telling the trader and sell it and so for me that doesn't make sense yeah. like everything needs its own place yeah. has its own place sometimes you got to create that space for it um and that's simply because I think I've learned um that someone is interested. You just have to find that person. It might take you a while, it might take you different avenues, but someone is keen on it. So these are the these are the plants you uh grow, right? What happens at harvest? You f- you're now going to pick the fruit, the cherry. Yeah. How do you go about processing then? So, uh, actually even the harvest is interesting in India. Um you go to places like Brazil, very flat land like you can literally stand and you can see the other end of um the farm and so what they have is mechanical harvesters it's almost like a it looks like a jcb a tractor kind of and it's 
now it's man powered i'm sure ai will take over shortly where you're just going through these grids you know and it's just stripping these trees off the cherries but for us we don't have that luxury we have steep slopes they're like mountains and little hills you know and so it's all manual and so most workforces around in coffee you could say not just in the south are women which is really interesting and something we are very proud of because um even in our area um we we have a lot of women workers who have to do this and so um it's a very skilled job because you need to at certain times you're going around a bush and you need to know how to bend it because you bend it the wrong way and a 20 year old bush is just sla- snapped you know and so um it took a very a, a big mindset change where up until i got involved um it was sort of get everything off the bush greens yellows reds blacks everything all the cherries were coming out um but for quality for a quality standpoint you need red only and i would now i'm realizing more and more it's not even red it's almost like a maroonish yeah. burgundy yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and the logic is like you just leave that out in the wild or you just sit and you watch it from a distance whether it's a bird or a civet or a monkey it's going to go for that cherry so it, it's it's nature's sign it's saying come and eat me swallow the seed go poop it out somewhere else and a new plant comes out you know that's when we come we step step in pick pick it at the right time uh a lot of sanitization a lot of even at the end of the day we have to do another sort another sorting session and then the magic happens the fermentation and that's where it all begins but um yeah like you touched upon before it's definitely got to do with the health of the soil and the farm itself and so a lot of factors going into it what about the other things growing at the farm yeah i, I that's what i've been really blessed is my granddad actually my great granddad before him uh we grow a lot of avocados um that's something i've really enjoyed working with because uh i used to live in australia i came back and was trying to figure out what to do with my life for a bit and then it was avocado season you know and uh i don't know how i mean i kind of know how but uh i was a 1 kilos you know and so like i'm like man <laughs> i got to sell these you know they're just there yeah. and um it is about connecting the dots i have the trees the i have i can build the market um get that sort of direct trade connect going um that is not only a good income or not only a good sort of personal pocket money for me but it adds to the diversity of the soil we we take that for granted in india and we always talk about shade grown yes th- don't get me wrong we grow coffee in under fairly dense canopies um if you have indigenous trees like figs and red cedar and things like that again it's beneficial but at the end of the day it's a soil you know it's a soil that binds everything and so um the more diversity there is the more you'll see like what we call mycorrhizal networks so like fungi basically passing on messages um you just literally go anywhere at kerry hawklu you put a shovel in the ground you get earthworms and things so it's very rich nutrient rich soil and so um that's helping the coffee it's not people ask me like hey because we have like oranges and lime also they're like will it taste like lime if there's a lime tree not really but indirectly it adds to the sort of health which again it's not that lime will equal lime yeah. but um uh, having two trees next to this will actually benefit this coffee plant and then you might get something added to it which boosts it in a sensorial sense but um yeah we're still i think there's a lot a lot of research to be done to be honest fair you also have snakes at the farm like snake yeah. head is one of your coffees name yeah yeah the... actually the snake head is a fish and um i want to um do some case studies this year to actually showcase this um it's an indigenous fish to india that i've got an older brother my brother myself and my dad we used to fish for a lot as kids and so uh basically it's a predatorial fish that lives in fresh water and so if you go to the kaveri river which is a couple hours from us um they live in the shallows and so we'd use a a spinner a lure three hook lure and you'd actually cast it in the shallows under the trees under the shade of trees and mean looking fish man like i got you know it's got eyes on top of its head it's a predator it's waiting at the surface and so you have lures which mimic 
uh, frogs. You have laws that finish uh, mimic uh, baby fish or um, anything, insects, you know. And so it's got a reflector on it and you see this big fish come up from the deep and then boom, just gobbles it up. And uh, so the logic there, or the analogy there was... Um, they, we have them in our rivers as well and all of these, sorry, our lakes um, as well. And uh, these lakes are spring feds. We have random springs popping up in the monsoon. And uh, I actually use that spring water to ferment the coffee. And I wanted to add, That's for me, it's a, that's the beauty of it, man. You have to tell the story. You Like I always say, the cup has to speak for itself, but then tell the story about the beans. And so that water has a history, the, the, the coffee cherries, the block it's from has a history. And so... I try and give it names for people to kind of remember and hopefully help a yeah. conservation angle as well. So using that water for fermentation. For well. fermentation, yeah. Let's get into fermentation. Yeah. So you, you've picked the cherries from uh, the farm, sorted them out. Now let's get into washed, unwashed, whatever else. Okay. So I've actually been thinking about this a lot because the more I get involved, the I feel like the less I know, you know, and I'm like, damn, <laughs> yeah. this is... Uh, something that will always keep me going which is exciting in a way um, largely and broadly speaking you could say um, washed honeys and naturals are the three broad processes and so let's start with the natural and so the natural as the name suggests it's left as is it's also called the dry process and so um, of course water is used in the flotation process to sort of get the the logic is there when you float something like how a rotten egg floats to the surface same thing cherries or any fruit for that matter which will come to the surface something is wrong with it on the inside Gen in this case it's a seed which is the coffee bean and so um that is really important doing that because like uh, certain coffees you'll see where you look at the bag and there's four different colors that's not what you want yeah. you know and so um you lose out specialty coffee you lose out your numbers are a lot lower because of quality control so that's almost your first free tip like first elimination of sorts yeah absolutely it's a way to um uh standardize it yeah. I, I think of it as like making something homogenous you want the mixture to be the same you know in the sense that uh yeah same the cherries there shouldn't be different moisture levels and things like that and so Basically, with the natural, it's fermented whole fruit. You try and leave the fruit unpenetrated because um, the fermentation has begun as soon as a person removes the cherry from the bush. It's already begun. Like how you get a banana and yeah. you keep it at home, you'll see it change colors, oxidize, things like that. Um, but then you expose the same fruit to different conditions. It can be pressure. It can be, let's say, in the example of carbonic maceration, pressure and carbon dioxide as an input you know or you couldn't do it in my case underwater and so you're depriving certain microbes but also accelerating or giving the platform to other microbes to break down the sugars and so um the natural is really interesting i think that's where india's palate is at at the moment we like funky flavors tropical fruit fruit flavors it's interesting to go overseas and see what uh, that for me has been a nice learning curve to see what do people like you know people don't like naturals everywhere which is interesting i think we are in about two years we'll be past this phase to be honest and uh back to the wash coffees which is the opposite end of the spectrum where the cherry which has two seeds inside of it two beans inside of it is split and so um what we call the cascara yeah. is um spanish for husk or skin um that's kept separate there's a pulpy sugary layer that sits around these beans called the mucilage um that's where the sugars are and that's where the microbes come in and that's where control comes in and so that is again fermented you can do it different ways you can do it long short underwater without water um and then you pressure wash it it's almost like a like a washing machine actually where high power cylinders are hitting these beans and it comes out nice and clean um that gives you more nuanced notes it's like you can tell hey this is lemon zest this is maple syrup this is caramel and a lot less funky a lot less confusion on the palate um a honey is in between so we're doing we're splitting the cherry um again the cascara and uh the beans are separated but we're not washing we're just letting it caramelize almost onto the bean um 
it's something that I have had success with this year, and I realize never say never in coffee because I was very against it before in the sense that it takes a lot of manual work, and I had to put two more people, and then you're thinking about the numbers about how much to pay them. But um, it's not really fluking it. Sometimes f- factors can work in your favor, especially climatically, and you have to do whatever you can in those few days. Or uh, December last last December I was in Chikmagalur. I couldn't come to Kerala mm. that time, but I got to Ratnagiri and I got a master class in processing from Ashok, which is like he's the best man. It was one of my best <laughs> yeah. coffee experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's like what I really respect about Ratnagiri, both Mr. and Mrs. Patre. What I'm doing now has been four years. Yeah, they've been doing it for twenty years. You know, which is yeah. unbelievable. Like people don't realize. You go anywhere in the world if they've heard of if a good roaster has heard of Indian Arabica, chances are it's Ratnagiri, yeah. which is that's kudos to them. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of work, and this is pre-social media, pre everything. They literally went met roasters, met traders, went to expos, and it's not easy. A uh, big shout out to them. They're both yeah. very, very Agreed. good people. Uh, let's take a short break. When we come back, I want to get into the roasting side of things and uh, why Kere Haklu has become so cool in this space. Sweet, sounds good. Hey, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. Listeners, presenting to you Club Varta Lab, the premium tier offerings for our podcast. Here you get a number of perks like uh, access to extra bits and clips from the episodes, completely unfiltered, uncut, and raw. The chance of watching or listening to the full episodes two days before the official release, and absolutely free of cost entry to the Warta Lab, just us live shows. That's right, stories in person, occasional live streams of the episode tapings on YouTube, an exclusive members-only Telegram group with Akash and Naveen, and you also get your name on the producer slate at the end credits of all the episodes. Wow, that's a lot. So go to YouTube.com/WartaLab and click on the join button to become a member now. On the wire talks Siddharth talks to internet policy expert Namrata Maheshwari about the recent internet shutdown in Punjab and how it affected the people. On all things policy Saurabh and Pranay discuss the development of Nordic Air Defence Alliance and its implications. And on the Habit Coach podcast's Know Your Coach series Ashton shares how he stops his mind from wandering. Once again don't forget to visit our merch store on the IBM Podcast website. We have some exciting stuff for you. Follow us on social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. If you like our shows, spread the word. Tell all your family and friends and don't forget to rate and review our shows wherever you're listening to them. You'll also find all our shows on youtube.com/ibmpodcasts. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week, LIC India, Yono SBI, Cash Free Payments and HDFC Mutual Fund. Thank you for making this possible. Welcome back to an each thing. I'm with Pranoy. We're talking everything coffee. And uh, Pranoy, so we till now have spoken about getting to the green bean stage, right? What do you call that? Now comes the roasting process, which will then ultimately go to a customer. How do you go about working with roasters? And in fact, who was the first roaster your initial days, and uh, how is it now? Um, it changed a lot in a few years. Um, so my first season, as I mentioned, was twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. But actually, even before I got involved in the twenty eighteen season. I remember reading a perfect daily grind article about the honey pro- what a honey processed coffee was and I wasn't at Kerry Haklu then um I happened to be there for a few days in December when some friends were visiting and I told my dad I was like why don't we just try this you know pulp and don't wash and at that time it was an alien concept you know like what are you doing kind of thing but he was like yeah let's go for it you know you never know and very supportive of him and um uh that happened to cup really well and my brother i've lived in australia and my brother lives there now as well um we just decided you know what, let's send a sample and uh marvin shaw at disciple in melbourne he really liked it and he asked us for it it was a tiny 40 kg man at the end of it and um so I ended up going there and uh, we kept a bit of it as well and that season uh when i was working at a farm called krishi crest in delhi um again very suddenly exposed to pluto kai and people drinking black coffee yeah. which even for me as a person who's grown up around coffee was very new um i met bharat from billy who and kritivas from cafe serado um they picked up our coffee so washed and this honey as well um but i wouldn't say that i processed them i only started processing the coffees from the year after that 
Um, that year was um, Blue Tokai, Corridor 7, and um, I think Marx, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, since then, a lot of new names, a lot of new roasters, a lot of new personalities, um, which is interesting. I think it's always good to have fresh blood, you know, in the market and sort of healthy competition because that's when it elevates. Otherwise, we yeah, it becomes a bit stagnant. Do you have... <coughs> When you when you start talking to a roaster, is there a guideline that you put out that I think this coffee will be better like this, or uh, like how does that go? Because if tomorrow your coffee is not roasted to your liking, and a customer doesn't like it, it'll ultimately come back to you. Yeah, hundred percent. I um, I would have to say my palate's quite picky now, and I kind of even my decision making is a bit picky, and it's not to sound arrogant or anything like that. It's just to sort of make sure that the 12 months of work that we put in is elevated further or done justice, you know, because I I don't call myself, a, I roast, but I don't call myself a roaster. I, I, I've seen a lot of roasters and what they do is amazing. So I don't call myself a roaster, but I have a machine. I have friends who have machines, which I roast on. And um, it's, what I always describe it as a science and an art, you know, you need to, and it's always like you have machines and, um, programs which will do it for you but you got to be intuitive you know you got to be like okay this is not normal I got to adjust the flame or the drum speed or anything like that or the airflow and um, so where I'm at now is actually with roasters um, I think a lot of them value my opinion which is which I'm grateful for a lot of them I'm like hey I don't think go this dark or don't go this light or whatever or position it as a sampler pack with two different profiles of the same lot but um, I do get a lot of random emails I have to say some of them are not they lack etiquette which I don't like you know it's like I just get a DM on Instagram or even an email I would like sample <laughs> that's it of what yeah. hi who are you I would like to know a bit about you about your roastery but then you kind of sort of figure out what the person is what their intentions are and I don't reply I don't I don't feel obligated to even reply yeah. to those but you do get some people saying I really appreciate when someone is admitting of the fact that they just started hey I'm a home roaster I'm still learning my trade I'm interested if you have anything to offer I'd love a sample fair enough I started yeah, somewhere yeah. you know not so long ago I was in the same boat and so um, I like that I like that sort of for me it's just about not about the business, it's about being like, are we on good terms? We don't have to be best friends, but I would just like to have a pleasant conversation with you. And um, But yeah, I think uh, with the samples now, um, again, I think I'd like, I'd like to go for my Q grading at some point, maybe this year or next year. It's a lot of money, to be honest. I don't know if I... How much does a Q grading cost? I think about two lakhs at so, least. So for uh, so Q, Q grading is like uh, one of those W said wine qualifications. Yeah. So... Uh, you basically have that qualification and you've learned how to taste smell coffee in a very uh, yeah, systematic approach. Basically, you can score anyone's coffees at that yeah. stage or hopefully at least in the spectrum of other Q graders and primarily Arabica, they're doing courses for Robusta as well. Um, but the more I look into it, it might not make sense for me as a producer because at the end yeah. of the day, you have to do reports, charge for them. Um, but yeah, uh, coming back to that, uh, basically when I get asked for a sample, even if it's it's gone well, I'm in a position now where I'm like, especially if someone has a sample roaster, I'm like, I'll send you a sample, but can you roast it and send it back to me? Yeah, fair play. You know, because um, again, at the end of the day, people will see Kerry Haklu roasted by XYZ. And if the roast hasn't turned out to their liking or if they go to a cafe if they have a cafe space or they provide to a cafe and they don't like the cup, it's going to be Kerry Haklu that's crap. Not the roaster, not anyone else, you know, not, it could be the barista's fault, it could be the water on the day, so many things, you know, but that's what you remember. And so, um, have to be picky in a way where I'm like protecting, um, not just the reputation, but I would like for people who are well informed to handle this and yeah. be in charge of this. For me, the good thing was that I was seeing a lot of light to light medium roasts of yeah. Kerry Haklu, yeah, which okay. was just refreshing to see. And I think I'm personally in that uh, coffee journey phase of my life that I yeah. want more light to light medium. Yeah, And uh, I think you're seeing a lot more of those in the market, but 
there was a while that for a decent time there would only be couple of options agreed and that's changed a uh, decent amount yeah i think that makes a very versatile brew the light medium especially yeah. like maybe not espresso unless you really yeah. know what you're doing with long extractions and things but uh for the average home brewer who um knows their stuff has their equipment or can go to a cafe and be like okay cool it's 11 a.m i want a bit of a pick me up um it's a no nonsense profile and you know what you earlier said about let's say home brewer reaching out to you i think that's one thing i really enjoy about the coffee space yeah. the whole community angle yeah i think the moment you say that hey i'm an enthusiast or whatever like people will entertain like everyone wants to share knowledge at yeah. least that's what i've seen uh what sample did you get from me and thank you so much for that <laughs> no of course uh so this year i've tried to raise the bar with a lot of the coffees um not just with the ferment times and the ferment conditions but also the scale i realized that unique nano lots and micro lots are great but if you can do that times 3 or times 4 it makes life a lot easier um, easier eventually i would say at the start it's a lot more space and a lot more hands that you require but as the in this case a natural process it's taking up a lot of surface area and as it dries it's losing space you know it's losing the surface area and so um it still involves a lot of care you got to hope for the best with the weather this year we got poly houses to be extra sure and extra in control of what we're doing um but yeah this is what um i like to produce and process coffees that i like drinking I, and that i'm proud of you know if it's a coffee that i don't enjoy brewing i won't process it unless it's a request saying hey i'd like this on this spectrum of flavor notes um like or at least you could say funky or not funky in in the naturals for example i would say this is on the cusp where you still have what i would describe as clarity and cleanliness in the cup and uh, but still like for me it's like lychees and oh um, great yeah, yeah and like a sangria of sorts but um yeah trying to up the game i think now i actually go back uh, tomorrow and um a lot of new samples and when does this harvest start to get to customers uh so we've actually sent our first lot last week um and when i get back maybe on monday i have another lot to send This year we're getting into exports and we're actually just closing some lots uh, which will be hopefully on the water in a month and um so you could say basically we like getting coffees out of the south before the monsoon sets so by may for me april if i can be done that's great latest may where okay boom it's on the road we have transport partners um just because you want that you'd rather it be in a warehouse in gurgaon or Pune yeah. or Bombay also where of course there's the monsoon here as well but better storage conditions more space you have forklifts things like that for me again Kerala clues become a cool estate at least uh, i think in the consumer realm it will take more time to become more and more popular but in the community Kerala clues been pretty well established now and you're saying you only got here in 2018 19 what's your story in all of this what were you up to before <laughs> Uh, it's crazy man like um if you told me 10 years ago i'd be here i'd, I'd laugh no way you know um but that's just life i guess and uh um i was actually in australia uh, till 2017 so 2012 to 2017 i was in australia did my undergrad in sydney um studied for i mean i worked for 2 years after that um actually came to visit india visit my family and um i was dating an aussie at the time and she came down with me and she was like i took her to kerala clue and then amy and amy was like uh you should do something about this place and i was like damn <laughs> i think you're right you know i should and that sort of got the wheels turning in my head and um uh i was like you know what i'm going to give it a shot and it was in coffee at the start to be honest i wasn't thinking about coffee we have four cabins and so um i was thinking about eco tourism i was thinking about even like with something i haven't got around to as yet is like retreats like i've done crop to cup you workshop. did right? yeah you do that yeah, crop to cup but i want to do like yoga retreats i want to do like not really boot campy stuff but very bring fitness enthusiasts and even bird watchers like various residencies um which is a nice angle to have because like you said that's a way of 
quenching someone's curiosity. You know, they're like, okay, cool, I follow you on Instagram, but now I can come there, I can stay there, I can eat the food that you eat, I can drink the coffee that you grow. And then suddenly someone's mind is open to something which, um, and as you would know, word of mouth is amazing. It goes the longest way. Of course, I post a fair bit on Instagram, but we've never advertised, and my dad's never advertised for the cabins, and so it's been a very organic growth. And so um, I got back with that 2017 May, I got back. And so June, July was avocado season and um, just trying to figure out what to do with my life and actually applied for some jobs and things like that. Again, not knowing that this is what I'd be doing, but uh, there were massive avocados on the trees. And um, I'll never forget, I was sitting with my friend in Bangalore and her mom and we were having dinner and I mentioned, happened to mention that or oh, next week I'm bringing some avocados. And back then Facebook was big and she was like, oh, like um, I'm on a Facebook group. It was called uh, Foodies of Bangalore and it was an all women group. She's like, if you want me to post, like I can post and say, hey, if you'd like to order, just WhatsApp this number, WhatsApp Pranoy. And I got like eight or nine orders. And um, I remember taking the bus from Chik Maglur to Bangalore with a box full of avocados, borrowed my mom's car, drove around, delivered. And I miscalculated and actually made a loss on the first delivery. But what came of it was that one of the eight people was a chef. And she was like, she could tell that I was just on my feet all day, sweating, tired. And she's like, hey, come come in, have a cup of tea. And uh, she said, what else do you have? And I was like, hey, I'll let you know. Like next week I'll have oranges and pepper and things like that. And that's where it started. And so I got involved and then I was like, okay, it takes a lot of understanding, especially the harvesting of avocados. You need to know when to pick them, how to package them, how to handle them. Um, and then taking a step away, I moved to uh, Delhi in 2018 to work with Krishi Kress, as I mentioned. Amazing farm man. Yeah, Achintya, who's a friend of mine now, good friend of mine now. Um, amazing things. Wow. Just That's where actually I was exposed to the world of fermentation. That's where I realized I need to stop looking at mucilage yeah. and that. It's chemical reactions that you have to understand. It could be kombucha making. It could be sauerkraut making. At the end of the day, you just need to know what's going on under a microscope. And um, then I came back and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a go. Um, and I just started really, really small micro lots. And then it's just been growing uh, almost exponentially since then. That's amazing. And you were saying you were saying you're gonna start exports now? Yeah. So the states uh so we like I mentioned the guy in Marvin in Australia picked up a coffee but then COVID made a lot of supply chains difficult. But I'm hoping to get three lots over to him as well. Um but some importers and buyers in uh, the States, North America basically. Um we'll have a coffee in a few months and um that's the next step. You know, you can't really have all not just all eggs but it's sort of in an economic sense there's a risk of the bubble bursting you know and me as a producer and Kerry Haklu as a brand and a company we need to protect ourselves yeah, and fair. not be be reliant on a lot of things and a lot of situations and so a lot of relationships in the business in a business sense and so yeah also I'd on a personal side I'd like to see the world that way like I want to it's nice to live out there in the jungle but I'm 28 I want to see the world and this is a beautiful way of doing it you know meeting roasters yeah. meeting chefs everywhere who um, are interested in your produce and value it I have a question now whether this is more on the estate and processing or it's more on the roasting or it's honestly a combination of both uh, one experience that I've had in past few years of brewing a lot of pour overs and uh, clever drippers and stuff to me Indian coffee requires a lot more work and precision on brewing versus let's say an Ethiopian or something there have been times that I've left it on a clever dripper for 5 minutes forgotten about it come back and it's tasted great Yeah. but I think with, with an average Indian coffee that would not be the case at all Like the whether it's a bitterness aspect or whatever that changes super quick uh, any views on that? Why, why does that happen? Um, one thing I have to say also is I think that 
the very nascent specialty industry in India were a bit too caught up on recipes. In my opinion, like you, I get asked, hey, I bought this coffee from this roaster of yours. What do you, I have a pour over or an AeroPress at home. What do you recommend it? And I tell people, I'm like, I have my, my go-to inverted AeroPress recipe as well. But I always tell people, it's up to you. You know, it depends. What do you like? How do you like the coffee? And I don't have an answer to that. And so I tell people, cup it first. That's a completely blank slate in a sense where you're, it's a bowl, you know. And so you're getting from minute, when you taste at minute 10 all the way to 45, you're getting a a fair judgment of what it can taste like. Just take us through the cupping process. Oh, yeah. Okay, fair. Um, so cupping is what you would describe, like what we're talking about, what Q graders do. That's what they do as a profession so what they do is um, you have to send them the green beans you can't send them roasted beans because first and foremost they want to see they do a visual analysis they'll put it on a black piece of paper some of them go even with UV lights to see um, any insect affected beans any sort of sometimes your machinery can cut the beans and things like that and when you put a UV light it the light bounces back it's like almost like a disco ball sometimes and um, so they'll put it in a sample roaster. The kawa is the most common one nowadays, but most people in labs have small probats and things like that. Um, and you generally cup the next day. Even two, three days is okay, but just because you generally cup 20, 30 coffee, coffees at one go. Uh, what that means is you, you seal it, you label it, um, you try and keep it as um, sort of standardized. You don't really want to know what coffee is what. So because then you're, you're think your mind's already yeah, yeah you're biased you're already perceiving certain things that may or may not be there um, and so yeah you just have a bowl a normal think of it as a white bowl but on the inside you have generally it's darker color it's like a brown or a black and that's because you don't want to see the color of the coffee because if I see a black coffee or a darker colored coffee I'm already expecting toastier notes I'm expecting dark chocolate, those things. And if I see a lighter one, I'm like, okay, this might be nuttier, things like that. That's why I add the element of a red light. I like not seeing the colors at all because, and then I, I often get someone like my dad, I'm like, come in, change the cups around. So I don't know what's yeah. what, you know? And so uh, I'm just on the bottom using a whiteboard marker. You write one to 10 or whatever. So you know later. And um, so yeah, first you grind it fresh. Um, you have a very specific ratio Generally, it's 11.5 to 12 grams to 200 ml of water, just off the boil. Uh, first, you grind it fresh on like, you could say medium coarse, um, just coarser than a pour over. And um, you smell it. You smell it dry. You make a note of it. You go down the other nine coffees. You put hot water in. You smell it again while it's wet. A lot of things are happening. You know, the water is recently hit by, sorry, the coffee is recently hit by water. And so a lot of reactions going down. You have a stop clock running and at minute four, you take a spoon, you actually, and when you're sniffing, it's almost like my friend Bryce, um, who I met in Nepal, he has a good analogy. It's like a dog sniffing its bowl. You have to get up close and personal with it, you know, and that's it. Like with wine and everything, it's a lot of slurping and... None of these things are elegant. Nah, never. Yeah, never. There shouldn't be. That's yeah. what makes it fun. <laughs> and you come out all messy, but it's, and there's uh, a lot of noise, but... Uh, yeah, so you go in with a spoon, you actually break what we call the crust. Uh, again, go down the line and you clear the crust. And so that's at four minutes. It can take you a minute to do the whole thing. But um, you don't actually taste. You can taste for minute eight. I don't taste until 11 or 12 minutes simply because it's hot. And one, you can't perceive a lot on your tongue at that point, but also you can burn your tongue. And so um, let's say from minute 10, 11, 12, all the way up to at least 45, some people go up to an hour where, depending on where you are in the world, it cools at different rates. And so um, you want the coffee when it's at minute 45, let's say, to taste as good as it did at minute 12, if not better. If it tastes worse at minute 45, something's gone wrong. Most likely the fermentation. And so... You have coffees which taste good at the start and then 20 minutes in it's fallen off a cliff. And what you said about the Ethiopian in your Clever Dripper, that happens. You know, I tell people, I'm like, sometimes you're on a call, you forget you have a cup of coffee, you've taken a call, come back and you taste it and like, this is amazing. Yeah. You know, and that's also got to do with, again, the heat and all of that. But 
that's what happens it's the right kind of processing and to answer your question about why it's a bit more complicated i think the quality is still getting there to be sure. honest you know it's still sort of ethiopia is very interesting for example that's where a lot of coffees have come from you know and so um I'm actually going there and Ethiopia and Uganda and I want to see you know I just want to see what people do and believe me when I say it's not fancy yeah, you it's know? not fancy at all yeah it's yeah. just the plants doing yeah. the talking it's yeah. the terroir as we yeah. call it in wine and coffee which is boosting these plants you know and so even in hygiene sort of standpoints i would say a lot of our indian farms and plantations are oh, better yeah. Oh, yeah. you know we have raised beds we have sort of poly houses and things like that and so but it's years and years and years of experience they know exactly what to do if you have bad weather they know what to do and so um yeah it's a toss up between traditional and modern but uh, we have to find the confluence of the two Yeah you see so many pictures of a lot of these farms from across the world even Panama and stuff and like our estates look so much grander yeah and more well kept than everything fair point yeah yeah uh what are your handles on Instagram Kerry Haklu and yours uh mine's Kerry Haklu and Tipaya T H I P A I A H um that's just my last name um i post a bit too often but yeah That's yeah, cool. dude, you you grow avocados and coffee that <laughs> has hipsters things. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, but uh, I think I think to whoever's listening, uh, the residencies that you're planning, I think I think those are really cool. Even the farm to cup one was a very cool idea. Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for being here, man. No, man, Appreciate thank you it. for having me. And honestly, this is a really good platform for people to to share what they do. And thanks for the opportunity.